Welcome back to Coriam, the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue Emergency Medicine Residency Program. I'm Brian Gaberti. And I'm Breed C. What's on deck for today's episode, Bree? I wanted to delve into something a tad bit controversial, acute otitis media. Yeah, it doesn't get much more edgy than kids' infected ears. Okay, hear me out. This is the most common infection seen in pediatrics and the most common reason children receive antibiotics. But there's a lot of discussion in the PEM world for a couple of reasons. One, we lack a diagnostic gold standard that can be performed by non-specialists. Two, it exists in a population that can't really articulate themselves. Three, there are many predisposing factors. And four, there's a new vaccine that is changing what we consider to be the most common bacterial culprits. Yeah, we grew up in the all-or-nothing days, the pre-pneumococcal conjugate vaccine era. And since 2000, with routine vaccination series being completed by six months of age typically, we have seen a 29% reduction in acute otitis media caused by all pneumococcal serotypes in children who receive the vaccine. Although more stringent criteria for what we call acute otitis media may also be contributing to this drop. But before we take a deeper dive into the cause, let's back up and talk about who gets acute otitis media. They're the people you least want to be irritable. Six to 18 month old children, aka our kids' ages. And some of the factors that put these tykes at risk of developing this infection are wintertime, daycare, being male, reduced duration or absence of breastfeeding, and exposure to tobacco smoke. And which bugs are we worried about? Well, traditionally, the makeup has been strep pneumo, non typable Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella. But, like you said, Brian, The prevalence rates of infections due to strep pneumo are declining due to the Prevnar vaccine, while the proportion of Moraxella and non-typable H. flu are increasing. Currently, non-typable H. flu is the most common cause of bacterium. Regardless of the bug, however, the diagnosis may be a difficult one to make. I totally agree. When it comes to diagnosis, emergency physicians can have a hard time because we're dealing with kids who have difficulty expressing themselves and who certainly don't want to let you look in their ear. But we do the best we can to try to piece together a history from the parents. And one of the key features is going to be ear pain or the parents telling you that the child has been tugging at their ear. They may also have fever, be more irritable, not as active, or have difficulty sleeping. Yeah, the history is important here, but what makes the diagnosis is the exam. And as you said earlier, the bar was raised for what we call AOM. In 2013, the American Association of Pediatrics came out with a paper to help us diagnose this infection. And a lot of this push is to help emergency providers distinguish AOM from otitis media with effusion, which doesn't require antibiotics. Okay, I'm all ears. What's the difference? (laughs) Well, bulging of the tympanic membrane is one specific sign that helps us differentiate the two. TM bulging has a positive likelihood ratio of 51 for AOM, as reported in one systematic review. In otitis media with effusion you're just going to see a pacification of the TM or air fluid levels. There will be no bulging of the tympanic membrane. Okay, got it. It's all in what we see in otoscopy. What are the updated criteria for what we are calling acute otitis media these days? There are going to be two categories. If you see moderate to severe bulging of the tympanic membrane or new onset otorrhea that isn't due to otitis externa, you've made the diagnosis. Now, if you see just mild bulging of the TM, The child also must have recent onset of symptoms within 48 hours, evidence of ear pain, complaining in verbal kids or tugging their ears in babies, or just intense erythema of the TM. So we make the diagnosis. Now we can treat, but this also is a bit more complicated. The practice of watchful waiting has been adopted in the U.S. wherein we give parents the option to observe the patient for two to three days. This decision to wait or to treat depends on a couple of key factors age, temperature, duration of atalgia, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, presence of otorrhea, immunocompetence, and access to follow-up. Exactly. Let's discuss them by age range. All patients less than six months will be treated. Next, for kids between six and 24 months, the AAP recommends treating unless they have unilateral AOM with mild symptoms, such as mild ear pain, less than 48-hour duration of symptoms, and temperature less than 102.2. Okay, a lot of exceptions here and some gray areas. We should stress that this is going to be a decision that we make together with the parent or guardian on whether to treat or observe. And know that in this age group, there's a significantly higher failure rate with just observing. 
This we see when we apply more stringent criteria for what we're considering acute otitis media and we compare the two options. So though the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends offering observation as an option, we have to keep this in mind and convey this when we're having a discussion with the parent or guardian. And if the decision is made to defer antibiotics, there should be a mechanism in place to ensure follow-up. Now, if they're over two years old, you should initiate prompt antimicrobial treatment unless they have the mild symptoms we described earlier. The difference between this group and the six to 24 month old group is that you can offer the option of observation, even if there's bilateral AOM. Bree, you're hurting my brain. I know, it's kind of complex. Luckily, there's a nifty algorithm in the show notes. Nice. Ultimately, this may not be an easy decision. Antibiotics have their own acute otitis media with a demonstrated reduction in otalgia, tympanic membrane perforations, and contralateral episodes of acute otitis media. However, they're no walk in the park and associated with adverse events like vomiting, diarrhea, and rash in some. So, we decided on antibiotics. What are we reaching for, Brian? In most cases, the tried and true high dose amoxicillin. Okay, who isn't getting it? Kiddos who received amoxicillin within the last 30 days, or they are allergic, or they have concomitant purulent conjunctivitis. Yeah, the first two exceptions make sense, but the last one's a little less intuitive. We set these patients apart because conjunctivitis with AOM should raise concern that the causative bug is H flow. Exactly. You can give Augmentin unless there's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to penicillin, in which case give a macrolide. An optimal duration is also age-dependent. Children less than 2 or any age with a TM perforation should receive a 10-day course. A shorter course of 7 days may be appropriate if they are older than 2. And what type of instructions and anticipatory guidance are you giving to parents when they head out of the ED? Well, first and foremost, anticipate not sleeping much. If you decide to observe... Ensure that they follow up with a provider, whether in the ED or their own pediatrician, in 48 to 72 hours. And give strict return precautions if the kid develops meningismus or facial nerve palsy, or if they are at all worried. Yes, it's important to spend time and ensure that parents understand what to expect and when to return. If antibiotics are given, let them know to follow up if there is an improvement in two to three days. The diagnosis of acute otitis media should be revisited, and if you're still suspecting it, consider that the causative bug is resistant to the prescribed antibiotic. Exactly. We should escalate care. If amoxicillin was given, you can give Augmentin. If Augmentin was given, you can give IM ceftriaxone. Now, the tricky part is if a macrolide was given. There isn't a clear answer here, so we should consult our pediatric ENT colleagues. Finally, if antibiotics are given and everything improves, the child should follow up in two to three months to ensure resolution of the middle ear effusion and make sure that there's no associated conductive hearing loss. Okay, let's tie up some loose ends. In one word, do decongestions and antihistamines work? Nope. Do anesthetic eardrops work? Maybe, but watch out for perforations. And what about Motrin, Brian? Maybe. Oof, that was an earful. Lots of controversy. Time for take-home points? Okay, let's do it. All right, first... AOM is a very common infection and one with a changing face due to the relatively recent advent of the Prevnar vaccine. Traditionally and globally, strep pneumo was the most common causative bug, but non-typable H flu is becoming more prevalent. This is important because high-dose amoxicillin may not be as effective against H flu. What clinches the diagnosis of AOM is bulging of the TM, and we must be mindful to distinguish this process from otitis media with effusion. The AAP updated their guidelines to include a watchful waiting option for certain qualifying cases, but know that the success rate for this in the 6-month to 2-year-old range is less than ideal. If the decision is made to observe, a mechanism must be in place to ensure close follow-up. And finally, depending on the response to therapy, the patient will require follow-up in 2-3 to three days in the event of treatment failure, and in 2-3 to three months even if symptoms resolve as expected. Well, that's all for this episode. Continue to follow us on Twitter at core underscore EM and visit us on our website, coreem.net. Until the next one, this is Brian Embry signing off.